Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. Christopher Media, let's make some noise. Welcome to Beer Nuts, a weekly excursion into the world of craft beer. Brought to you by MichiganBeerGuide.com. And now, here are the Beer Nuts. Welcome to Beer Nuts, everybody. I think this is episode 125 or so. This is JR here. I'm in Grosseal, Michigan. And the last beer on my untap was Push Hop North, Northeast IPA. It's a strawberry IPA from Parrot Brewing Company. Well, this is Lieutenant Dang. I'm in Springfield, Missouri, and my last untapped check-in was Vanilla Death 2018 from Revolution Brewing in Chicago. It's their vanilla oatmeal imperial stout that uh, we got it in a crowler, so I'm not sure if it, I, I think it was brewery only, but I'm not sure on that one. It was, uh, it was tasty. It was good. This is Greg over in Dearborn, Michigan. My uh, last untapped check-in was Panther Cub from Founders Brewing Company. Small porter aged in uh, Bliss Maple Syrup bourbon barrels and regular bourbon barrels. And uh, whole vanilla beans. It was pretty darn tasty. Uncle Pete here, also on Grozeal in uh, attendance with JR at his place. Uh, My last untapped was 313 Polish Lager by Grand River Brewery in uh, Jackson, Michigan. And uh, this Polish lager was a European lager. It was very light, very quaffable, very cold, bright white head, nice straw yellow color, and boy, was it good. I mean, I don't often go back to those uh, simple beers and light light uh, alcohol beers, but this one was refreshing, and in fact, it was a celebration of saying goodbye to the first 10 pounds off my waistline for 2019 so yeah congratulations cheers to that cheers well congrats to that uh tonight's episode is being going to be on belgian style quadruples we do have some authentic belgian quads and some uh american renditions um belgian style quads those would be but uh so uh i don't think uh, this is probably going to be too good for your diet, Pete. But uh, oh no, quads are pretty uh, hard, hearty, and uh, full flavored, and high in alcohol, and probably calories. But you know what? It's it's, it's some day. It's Wednesday. At least that's when we record these episodes. So let's get right into it. And before we do so, always want to uh, welcome all our uh, listeners to enjoy a, a beer with us. So. If you got them, smoke them, crack open a cold one, and then drink up with us. Hopefully, you've got a quad um, to drink with us. If not, uh, drink whatever you want. We're not pretensive here. We just want to introduce more good people to more good beer. That's kind of the mantra of the show. So so we're going to start something a little bit new to us. Uh, We're going to try to do in future episodes where we're going to try to all take uh, one beer from the category that we're, or or the theme of the night for our episode and have as many beer nuts as can get a the same beer in our hands as possible. So what we've selected for our quad episode was uh, Avery the Reverend, uh, Belgian style quadruple ale. Um, so uh, I happen to know that they have released this in 12 ounce cans, but uh, for better or for worse, the only ones I could find were 22 ounce bombers. It's a 10% ABV quad. Avery Brewing out of Colorado uh, and Boulder. So um, it says, "Created by God, feared by Satan, loved by all." Reverend Luther Tucker on the on the bottle. But let's uh, let's all uh, dive right into this. Uh, Pete and I here in the island have a bottle, and uh, Greg, I believe, has a bottle. I think Dan uh, unfortunately won't be able to join us because he couldn't find it out in uh, Missouri. But that's okay. He's got some. Some gems to follow up this with. So I just poured this in my glass. Uh, I get a uh, kind of like a muddy uh, medium to dark brown. And it looks like, a, you know, a little hazy, muddy uh, appearance. There's a, a thin a thin uh, head that slowly dissipates, uh, you know, like that, that cola looking color. And immediately upon smelling it, you can smell all kinds of like raisins, figs, some dark fruit, some caramel. You know, uh, I'm going to. Makes me want to taste it. You can tell there's a little bit of sweetness, too, on the nose. And it uh, follows up very much with the same descriptors as I just gave you on the aroma. It's got that really, it's a rather a little bit on the sweet side. Nice, sweet, malty, bready mm-hmm. uh, 
mouthfeel. Uh, I'd say it's you know a little bit thick with the you know a little bit sweet you know a lot of malt and a lot of sugar, a lot of sweetness, but uh, definitely getting you know a caramel toffee um, su- sweet like prune. I guess I usually say raisins, but in this case prunes I think would be closer a, a better more accurate descriptor. Maybe a little apricot, a little fruit, but it's a it's a lovely beer. Uh, a twenty two ounce bottle of this would be a real task for one person, so I'm glad that Pete's here to help me with it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him and uh, let you know what his his comments are. Yeah, I find it to be a very bright on the aroma. There's a lot going on. I get personally, I just brought to mind fruity. But I thought maybe a little more juicy fruits on the aroma. I, I'm not disagreeing that uh, it also has aromas of uh, caramel and brown sugar, a sweetness to it. But I was thinking more of like uh, juicy types of fruits too as well. And on the flavor, yeah, I might get a little cherry on that. Um, you know, it's, it's a real juicy, uh, not totally dark in my opinion, although the dark fruits are in there and uh it's a my my pour actually had quite a good clarity to it uh the head disappeared immediately Mm. but yeah i think this is at a 10 percent abv and it's not hot by any means and it um it's really good i mean i like the temperature this is at i'm not sure if uh warmer would be you know much different i guess I'll find out because I'm going to have a second glass to pour the other beers in here, so I'll leave this one set for a bit. But uh, never had this before, and I'm not a huge on the quads, not huge on uh, this style, so I appreciate the learning experience. Well, before we pass it over to Greg, because he's also going to be reviewing this, I'll just read from the Avery website. Uh, it's a year-round brew. It's a 10% quad, uh, a divinely complex and beautifully layered beer with hints of dark cherries, currants, and molasses, complemented by an underlying spiciness. Sinfully smooth, considering the high alcohol content. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Greg. Well, I mean, you guys are hitting everything on the head. Just you know, I mean, just keep reiterating what you guys said. I mean, a lot of uh, sweet sweetness to it, uh, both on the smell and the taste. Well, I, I mean really sweet i was really surprised by it um you know a lot of a lot of caramel um God, i mean there could be like a, a clove component in there as well I, you know that maybe that's what i'm picking up but i mean it's just really a, a delicious beer i mean it's my first time as well trying this and uh, i'm certainly not disappointed um it seemed like it, you know for a 10 percent, it's really an easy drinking beer and and uh, the price point in that was was pretty spot on from what we per- picked up at Merchants. Uh, uh, John, you remember what you paid for it? I think it was it was less than ten dollars, wasn't it? Oh, it's like six ninety nine for yeah. a bomber. Very reasonable. I mean, very, very great very price. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, this is great. It, I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a hop beer by any means, even though it has a a little bit of hops in there, um, but they're not really standing out for me. Uh, but the sweetness, of course. Dark Belgian candy sugar is going to really kick in and really contribute to the flavor and the color. And, of course, the West Mall yeast, uh, you know, it really gets uh, some characteristics into the flavor of this beer. So I have made Belgian, I don't know if I made a quad, but I know I put so much candy sugar in one Belgian beer that I made that the alcohol spiked up to around 17%. <laughs> and it was a sweet sugar bomb, but I, I we drank it. And I didn't, you know, that one wasn't going anywhere. That was going right down the gullet. But I like this, the Rev. The Reverend. It almost reminds me of like a spiked iced tea. You know, I mean, to me at least. I mean, the color wise, it, it looks spot on to that, but at least the taste wise, it's like a little iced tea reminiscent of it. Yeah, you're right. I think it'd be a great beer to uh, sit in front of the fire, read a good book, just in a there good go. simper. That's nice and sweet. Maybe a good after dinner drink too. But yeah, I'm definitely getting the some cherries, some black currant. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. High marks for this one for me. Yeah, good stuff. All right, well, Lieutenant Dan, I think uh, let's move on to you since you you must be 
thirsty listening to us drink. So why don't yeah, you take guys, it away with the next beer? It's been brittle just listening here. <laughs> um, yeah, I have uh, – <clears throat> what first one I'm going to start with is the Sixth Glass from Boulevard. Um, it is – one of the ones I remember early on in their Smokestack series, which was the – they used to come out just in four-pack, 12-ounce uh, bottles. And they were around for a long time. There was the Six Glass, uh, Tank 7, and Dark Truth Stout. That goes back to probably, I don't know, to around 2010. And then they've kind of come and gone. They've brought some more in. And so it kind of depends on your distributor maybe of what they – it kept in your market, but uh, um, this one's been around for a while, and um, it pours pours kind of a murky copper. Um, it's got a heavy head to it, like you guys were saying. I had I have a 16 ounce tulip, and it poured. It's got heavy, tight lacing and bubbles. Uh, good three finger head. It's just now finally settling down to where it. It's only about one and a half fingers <laughs> now, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I was trying to find the description from the brewery. Just hadn't got there yet. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give this one a sip. It's real, just lightly boozy on the on the nose. I wouldn't even really say there's any uh, too much, just a touch of sweetness, a little malty. But then you your first sip is kind of oaky, and then a touch of sweetness, uh, malt kind of caramely molasses, real light, but it's it's just a nice, nice combination of kind of those, some of those darker notes, kind of leathery, maybe, to, I don't want to say tobacco, but um, just dark sugar, brown sugar, maybe a touch, um, kind of reminds me of like a dark, dark, you know, like you guys were saying prunes. I wouldn't say prunes, I'd say more, this one's more um, like a fig newton, you know, it's a little bready, it's a little, little, got that kind of fig, jamminess to it um just real real light and then it kind of finishes real dry real 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 dry um it doesn't it doesn't just blow up your palate it's real nice across the palate and then it finishes just almost with a touch touch of peppery like black pepper i don't know if that's the you know if that's the alcohol or, or what that's from but it's um it's a 10.2 percent in only 22 ibus so it's a pretty big beer um it's it's I love this style. The quads are one of the first one big beers that I fell in love with because, you know, I don't mind a little bit of, of that residual sweetness and sugariness that can kind of come through from them sometimes. And there's, you don't get any real uh, clove or bananas like you do sometimes on triples or, or some of the other Belgians. Um, so this, this is, uh, this is, this is great. I haven't had this in a long time. Time, so it's nice to, to revisit and enjoy it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a style that, I don't know, we kind of forget about sometimes. Um, when you're looking at the Belgians, uh, interestingly enough, you got blondes, doubles, triples, and quads. Well, uh, blondes are, are yellow. They're blonde. Doubles are basically a uh, you know lower ABV kind of version of the quad. And then you go to triple, and you got like a much stronger blonde. And then you go to the quads and you get to dark ones again. So I'm uh, reading uh, an article uh, about this stuff right now. And one of the things I really enjoyed reading was uh, that the quads are full of dark malt and dark fruit, a distractive and coy prelude to their vigor and potency. Strong dark ales and quads are essentially siblings, much like old ale and barley wine. They seemingly overlap in profile. So in general, quads have more body, more residual sweet. Sweetness, strong dark ales have more delicate, drier palate, but we're splitting hairs here. They're very similar. So, <laughs> so uh, the nine percent ABV or greater, um, typically stronger than a golden triple. Uh, you know, quads are uh, pretty strong beers, and um, it says they're usually uh, made with nothing more than pilsner malt and maybe one or two darker malts. Um, offering notes of raisin, fig, date, cherry, and plum. Wheat and Munich malt are also key ingredients to some New World offerings. Prolonged boils and kettle caramelization can also be employed to further deepen the brew and add nuance. So I won't go on and on with this, but uh, uh, brews are usually 
fortified with a lighter dark candy sugar um, to add it body and maybe a little bit of a rum flavor. Um, so there are just some uh, highlights about it. And then it says, as with most Belgian ales, the top cropping yeast is expected to you know do its job and yield that Belgian yeast uh, unique flavor. And then you were... Uh, Review, Dan, you mentioned a pepper finish. Well, it says cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, and anise, among others, are familiar yeasty notes to devotees of the Belgian brew. So perhaps that pepper might have been one of those spices that uh, uh, yielded by that yeast strain. So hmm. there's a little bit, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just background on uh, for brewers and, you know, and ingredients and flavor profiles for... But... Uh, Interestingly enough, the article I'm reading is actually uh, all about Beer Magazine. Give uh, proper credits. Uh, uh, it does mention the beer that you're reviewing, uh, Dan. It's, it says the sixth glass. Tasting notes, Boulevard has been brewing outstanding beers for over 20 years in Kansas City, and this quad might be the zenith of its offerings. Pours deep amber with a decent head of beige foam and lace to match any Belgian. The aroma gives up a hearty, yeasty spice character of cinnamon, pepper, fig, toasted malt, and caramelized candy sugar. Quite creamy and full on the palate, this gives way to volatile awakening of peppery yeast, fig, candied orange, and peach jam. The malty backdrop is toasty with light caramel and hints of maple. The finish is a bit hot and lingers well into the next sip, one to savor at 10.5% ABV. So I think I've read enough now, but hopefully that shines some light. It was very uh, spot on to what you reviewed. You even picked the pepper right out of that, and it <laughs> mentions pepper twice there. So good review, Dan. Good job. And sounds like a great beer. I've never had this, but uh, certainly make it a point to give it a shot. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I forget living down here in, in southern Missouri. You know, Boulevard, You think I think of it as being darn near nationwide. You know, they're like 30, 40-plus states. But I forget that a lot of these, you know, the the smokestack series or a lot of the Boulevard beers. It just depends. They don't they don't make it in, in a lot of markets, and so there's a lot of their beers that I, you know, peep beer drinkers in my market might take for for granted. But uh, you know, guys like yourself up there in Michigan haven't even haven't even had a chance to see them in, in anywhere for sale yet. You know what was really cool to me about the whole thing and both of these beers so far is there's not a lot of additions to the beers in terms yeah. of all the flavors we're getting out of it those fruits were not added you know the spices were not added this is all characteristics between the malt the yeast and and whatever little hops they're adding and i think you know the belgian styles maybe that's what's the real lure to a lot of people is yeah. you get a really great flavorful beer just from the simple ingredients that you're using and not having to add a lot that's a great point, Uncle Pete. Good point, yeah. Well, I'm going to try to go out and find... We get Boulevard around here, don't we, J.I.? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we see them around here. Yeah, they have a pretty good distribution now because they're uh, in a conglomerate. I think they're with uh, Victory, is it? No, maybe it's not Victory. Uh, Firestone Walker is part of their group. Is it Fire... I can't remember if it's Firestone Walker or if it's who's got... Uh... Oma Gang, too. Is Oma it? Gang, yeah. Yeah, Oma Gang. Now, we don't get Firestone Walker in Michigan, but we get the other two. I was, like, hoping that when those uh, those com those breweries all merged, that, you know, we'd be able to get some Firestone Walker, but still no love from Firestone Walker here. But What, what are you talking about, these breweries all merging? What what did I miss? <laughs> oh, this is, like, a couple of years ago. They uh, I think they're owned by the same uh, parent company or... Uh, what is it a uh what do they call those uh investor groups well what's um, funny about it is that boulevard sold out they were one of the first big sellouts that i heard about and they sold for 120 million dollars and i thought man that's a lot of money you know it was just one guy that started it john mcdonald um you could you know you could do just about anything you'd want to do in your lifetime with that kind of money and then it was like a year later, Ballast Point sold for a billion dollars. But that's a whole, sorry, that's another topic. I don't want to <laughs> tangent and go on. But <laughs> Well, I don't think uh, anybody would disagree that the, that was, they overpaid for Ballast Point. But that was at the peak of uh, the craft yeah. beer boom, which is now, you know, simmering to, uh, it went from a boil to a simmer. So 
I think things are calming down a little bit now, with especially with the distribution and uh, you know packaged goods. Still plenty of room out there for you know local microbreweries to be the local neighborhood brewery, but the competition for the shelf is just really tough right now. But let's get back to this. We need more yeah. shelves. We need more shelves. <laughs> <laughs> and Jr., it's the uh, Duvel Murtgat Brewery. Duvel, that that's the, it. Yep, that's the parent company. Yeah. And if you've Ooh, ever had look. a Duvel, that's one of my favorite. It's a Le Chouf. The they have a strong ale. I love their have, golden strong ale. They have a reputation for kind of being a parent company that lets the them keep doing and running a good business, but just be like a good parent. You know, and help them grow and all that kind of thing. So yeah, we'll see. And that's that's fine with me. I you know they're not a threat to other craft brewers um, like some of the other big uh, right. companies. Exactly. ChristopherMedia.net. ChristopherMedia.net. Yeah, you know, let's not get off 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 the subject <laughs> here. I think it's uh time for Uncle Pete to break out our next beer. Oh boy, is it my turn? <laughs> Oh, this beer is so good. I've already had two glasses. All right, what do we got? I brought a prize out of my cellar when I went to uh, New Glarus Brewing uh, over the past uh, late summer, early fall, in August. I picked up their 25th anniversary ale, which is a Belgian quad, 11.5% ABV. Was brewed once, so it's is a limited, limited time. And I'll pour one up here and let Jr. pour while I talk about it some more. And it's a beautiful pour going there. Wow. <clears throat> so, uh, yep, eleven point five. Um, they're celebrating. They were celebrating uh, this past year their twenty fifth anniversary uh, in, in operation, and uh, they use a combination of German and English malted barley. Yeah, uh, Australian hops, Belgian yeast. This thing was rested in brandy ba- uh, brandy barrels. Mm. Um, wow. Harvest. They used a fusion of harvested Wisconsin harvested maple syrup from maple sweet dairy, and also Belgian candy sugar, which pushed the original gravity of this thing way up onto the scale. It says twenty three degrees Plato. I don't normally have the skills to do my Play-Doh to uh, to uh, conversions, but uh, on the original gravity. So uh, let's see how this goes with such a big alcohol beer. Okay, so it poured really uh, actively, great, great uh, carbonation, uh, beautiful uh, off-white head with a nice tan color. Man, a deep, deep, deep. Uh, Kind of a ruby red color. Oh, boy. Busy on the nose. I get some caramel, vanilla. Oh, it smells so smooth and sweet. Mm, that's one of those ones you could just enjoy just sniffing it for a while instead of drinking it. But we're going to drink it anyway. Mmm. Mmm. Ooh, that's warm. Wow. Warm and caramelly and toffee sweetness right off the bat, right up front. Man, the sugar just coats your mouth. It's kind of a real uh, coating, a real syrupy coating. I'm trying to find the brandy barrel in there. Um, This is very sweet. Maybe a little uh, cinnamon sugar kind of a feel to it. Um, The maple, I'm sure, is contributing a lot of the sweetness as well as the candy sugar. But, uh, boy, this is really tasty. I mean, this is a heavy malt-forward a uh, highly sweetened beer, um, very warming. I don't find it to be hot. When I said it was very warm, I didn't mean hot. Um, but I like the dark color. This is very intriguing. JR, I'll pass it over to you to see what you're getting out of this thing. Oh, you you hit a lot of uh, what I would have said. But, uh, gosh, it's, it's, first of all, just just fantastic. Um, and no, no surprise that, you know, whenever I've had anything from new Glarus, it, they take things to another level. And, uh, this is really, really complex. It's really, really tasty. Um, and I'm just reading up on it. I was really amazed. It says they have Aussie hops in here. So who would have thought? And, uh, but, uh, let's, I'm just going to, uh, 
give a little bit of an assessment here. I had a couple of sips and I, I'm, I'm enjoying it, but let's try to d- dive a little deeper into there. Definitely get the, you know, the similar to the other beer in aroma with the, you know, the sweetness. But uh, one thing that stands out is I can smell the maple. I can smell some maple in here. Definitely smell, uh, you know, sweetness, uh, some fruit. But the first impression compared to the other one is how more complex it is. Uh, I can taste a little bit of the brandy in there. I can taste a little grape. Um, it's definitely a little hotter. Uh, you know, the alcohol is pretty uh, obvious, but uh, not in a bad way by any means. Yes, yeah, a 500 milliliter bottle, um, different than you normally see. And uh, once I let this thing settle down uh, uh, after swallowing, I do pick up a little bit of the banana character um, from the Belgian yeast. It's not up front by any means, but it is there uh, in the back uh, once you've had a chance to let this thing go down. So I'm telling you, this so far to me out of the two, and the two were, the first one was great, and I think this one uh, really kicked it up a notch for me. Oh, I agree. It's it's taken it to another level, and gosh, I can, uh, you know, I'm getting a little bit of everything here. You know, some cinnamon, some uh, clove. Uh, I wish I would have bought more now that I'm, I'm having this. This is the only one I've got, and uh, I'm sure it would age well. It's only eight months or so that I've I've had it in my possession. But anyways, next time I'll pick up some more of this over there. I mean, this style if they have any more in their uh in their uh in their to go room. If you've never been to New Glarus, they have a great uh store, company store right there on the grounds. And I mean it's like grab a shopping cart practically. Everything's on pallets and just fill them up. Really is a world-class brewery. Every single beer I've ever had from New Glarus. Notch, love their fruit beers. You know, even their Spotted Cow is a, a fantastic beer. Um, pretty much uh, for a 25th anniversary ale, you know, you would expect it to be something special, and this certainly is. It fits the bill, and appreciate you sharing, with, sharing it with me, Pete. Thank you. You betcha, JR. I think we're going to have a real glow going here in about a half hour, and <laughs> tomorrow is probably going to call for uh, a three-peat, no pun intended, on the treadmill. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, uh, I think we're going to pass it on to Greg here while Pete and I enjoy these. So uh, uh, take it away, Greg. All right, that one's, that's a tough one to follow up, but uh, we'll see what we can do here. So... Uh, I picked this one up today at Merchants here in Dearborn. It's uh, uh, from Cuvée, Cuvée du Chateau. It's a Castile, their Belgian quad. Uh, comes in a, a, an adorable uh, little bottle here. I think it's uh, 11.2 fluid ounces. Uh, says the ABV is 11%. And it says a bottled on date of May 29th of 2013. So we have a little bit of age on this. Um, let's see, what else can I say about it? So the brewery is Castle Brewery in Van Hons- Honsenbroek, Belgium. So there you go, something new to learn. So first look at this thing, this is not a pretty beer. Pour is a very turbid, uh, brownish purple, believe it or not. Uh, held up to the light here, it does have a little reddish hue to it at the very edge. Poured very compact bubbles. <clears throat> Add some alcohol legs as I swirl it around the glass here. But like I said, it is not the prettiest of <laughs> beers at first look. So I've had it warming up here for a little bit. They did recommend the, the, the drinking temperature at 52 degrees, I believe it was. So let's get a smell of it. A it, uh, lot of sweetness. A lot of, um, lot of uh, sugar, uh, brown sugar, raisin. Uh, figs, uh, I more like uh, I'm getting like a almost like a Christmas spice out of it. I, I, it's maybe that sounds strange. I don't know. Maybe it really is. It really smells really wonderful. So obviously we'll take a sip of it, see how what it follows up as. Mm. Well, more of the same. Very sweet, dark fruits, uh, more brown sugar. Um, as expected with a almost five-year-old beer, I, I'm not getting a lot of alcohol. At least it's not, you know, tasting it right there, but I'm sure there's a little bit still there. But it's, it's warming me up nicely. Um, 
for a, for a January day, this is or evening, I should say. This is a really nice beer to be drinking down here. I mean, this is. I'd love to see what this is a little more fresher. Um, but wow, this is this is this is really crazy. I really like this. I don't know if anybody else has tried this yet or before, but uh, I would definitely recommend that anybody seeking this out. It was a little pricier on the scale, maybe it's about the same price or maybe a little bit less as we paid for the Reverend, but uh, you know, for a smaller bottle. But this is well, this is really good. I have not had this, but I can tell you that I've had some of the other Castile brewery beers, and they have an excellent reputation. I've enjoyed every one of them. Um, so I have to try their quad. Uh, I actually purchased the next beer I'm going to review from Merchants, where Greg often shops and where I shop sometimes. And we made sure we got a couple of different ones, and that was one of them ones he recommended. So I'm glad you got to pick it up. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, uh, it, we uh, the first couple of beers we had were you know New World versions of the quad, and now we're getting into some authentic Belgians. So. Um, on that topic, you know, there are Trappist breweries, which are uh, brewed by monks under strict, uh, 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 I guess, rules um, by a monastery, brewed in a monastery overseen by uh, actual monks. Then there are Abbey beers, which are similar, but they're not actually brewed under, you know, they're, I think, uh, more of like a style than a true Trappist, but... Um, so there are a lot more Abbey breweries in Belgium than there are Trappists. Uh, the, it says uh, here for to be a Trappist brewery, and I think there are eleven. There are eleven active Trappist breweries in the world: six in Belgium, two in the Netherlands, one each in Austria, Italy, and the United States. I know Spencer is the one in the United States. It's in New England somewhere. Uh, the beer must be brewed within the walls of a Trappist monastery, either by the monks themselves or under their supervision. The brewery must be of secondary importance within the monastery, and it should witness to the business practices proper to a monastic way of life. And the brewery is not intended to be a profit-making venture. The income covers the living expenses of the monks and the maintenance of the buildings and grounds. Whatever remains is donated to charity for social work and to help persons in need. So there's a little bit of information about a true Trappist brewery. Um, I don't think we have a true Trappist offering here tonight, unfortunately, but... Just wanted to make people aware of that. St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts is the American uh, Trappist Brewery, for those of you who want to know. And then, uh, of course, one of the most famous uh, quads, Trappist quads is West, Flet West Fletcher in 12, or commonly known and much easier to say, West Sea 12, which is uh, brewed at the St. Sixtus Abbey in Fletcher in Belgium. Are you drunk? Uh, no, but when you're trying to spell <laughs> West Letteren is W-E-S-T-V-L-E-T-E-R-E-N. So I don't think I'd be able to talk that fast if I was drunk. But. That's a roadside sobriety test right there. West man. Letteren. <laughs> well, but I just had a wet, my last Westy 12 uh, a, a few weeks ago, so it's a shame I didn't save it for this episode. We kind of hadn't planned this out, but um, if anybody ever gets a chance to get a Westy 12, um, it must be purchased in Belgium. I think one time they did make some available in the United States, uh, a small am amount of it, and it was in very high demand. But if you know anybody that travels to Belgium, you know they can buy quantities of this, and you could probably get one for about 20 bucks for a 12-ounce bottle and, or 11.2 ounce. And it's an iconic beer that you should really, you know, it should be a bucket list beer for anybody. But So there's just a little bit of a... You know, you know, catching up on our Belgian beer. It's been a while since we've done an episode on any kind of Belgian beers. And I know with the craft beer movement in full swing, there's a lot of these Belgian style beers here in the States, but we kind of forget, you know, where these brand the beers, you know, uh, originated from and the special things that they actually do. I love what Uncle Pete said about how the flavors in these beers aren't coming from fruits. And that's not to say that they don't, because Lambics have fruit in them, but the beers we're tasting tonight, you know, all these complex flavors are simply from the brewing process and, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years of, of monks brewing and perfecting their craft and figuring out how to, how to draw these fantastic complex flavors out of, uh, you know, the raw materials that they use to brew. So uh, the yeast, you know, the, the malts, and the hops, 
So it's really, really a uh, eye opening uh, episode that we're doing here. So all good stuff. Quadrophilia. That would be like an album for beer lovers. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Chris, when you're editing, uh, please, uh, dub in some who quadrophenia. And, uh, speaking of Chris, we'd like to just, uh, you know, unfortunately he's unable to be here, here with us tonight. And we are also missing Doug out. who's a little bit under the weather with the, the dreaded, uh, winter cold flu. So hopefully, uh, he'll get better soon and be able to join us next, next week. So shout out to, uh, to our beer nuts who aren't here with us tonight. And uh, on that note, uh, I think it's time to move on to the next beer, which happens to be my Belgian beer that I procured the other day. So let's. Great. Now I got to empty this glass. Third world problems. Twist your arm. <laughs> so I just opened a bottle of Straf Hendricks at Brugge's Quadruple Ale. It's from uh, Belgium, uh, De Havman Brewing, Walplein. Bruga, uh, and I'm not doing very well with all this. Uh, imported by Wetton in, Importers Incorporated, Mil- Middleton, Massachusetts. So let's just. Uh, this is entertainment. This is entertainment. A couple of Belgian beers and JR trying to pronounce everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Belgian beer glass here that I'm using. Not that I would do any better, I'll be honest, in all transparency, but you just yeah, go for uh, it, JR. Sorry, I'm uh, not up on my Flemish. <laughs> but, okay, so this is a uh, Straf Hendrick. Let me see uh, after Pete pours him. So, uh, I just poured mine into an authentic uh, Belgian glass. It's got a really nice LP head here, um, like a two-finger head. might have been my, my, my pour, but, yeah, Pete's is a little bit more in one finger. But so it's a. This is a very dark compared to the others. It's the darkest beer I've had tonight. It's almost black. It's, you know, very very dark brown. Maybe a touch of ruby. You can barely see through it. Yeah. The head's not white. It's got some you know brown to it. Um, like a you know again I always say cola, but this is maybe a little darker than most heads. So the nose, similar to the others, maybe doesn't have as sweet of a nose. As uh, the ones we've had, or it could be my palate's just getting wrecked. But so I'm tasting this. I'm get definitely getting I'm a little bit more carbonation on this one. The sweetness is there, but it's not as pronounced as uh, the Reverend is. Um, I don't get as much like that juicy fruit flavor. This is more you know dark. This is more plums, raisins, figs, at least to me, um, like a fig Newton almost flavor versus some of the ones that were a little bit more cherry and fruity. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's tasty. It's really tasty. It's 11%. Trying to see if I can get something here. See if I can read this. This looks like it's not in Flemish. Traditional top fermentation ale that referments in the bottle. Brewed by the unique family brewery De Hav Man, which has been located in the historical heart of Brugge since 1856. This quadruple is a special dark ale, brown according to a special recipe. Serve cool, contains a barley malt. It doesn't tell you a whole lot, but it's definitely more malty and more dark fruits to me than the uh, the juicy fruits of some of the f- previous ones. Uh, but it's it's really good. It's got a nice roasted uh, malt profile and uh, not maybe not quite as sweet as the other ones, but uh, pretty much a treat. Nice bready mouthfeel to it. Um, that's what I think I like most about it. Like a little bit of maybe nut. Not like a fig, fig and nuts. Pete, what are your thoughts? Oh, you really want to know? <laughs> I do. Well, on the aroma, initial impressions were as if I put my nose behind the ear of a Belgian bombshell that was wearing a sweet perfume and uh, leather. She's wearing leather. <laughs> wow. I'm cracking myself up here. Holy crap. This stuff's so good, I'm already getting a glow from those other beers, and now i got to go into this. But, yeah, I'm being kind of serious. It, it did have a perfumey aroma, a little bit of leather on the nose to me. Um, and the mouthfeel, as soon as you take a taste, this thing is so lively carbonated. I've not had yet tonight one that had this much active and lively carbonation going. So immediately on the tongue, it just turns to a creamy foam. And that's great because it's gonna dis, you know, it's just gonna disperse across your taste buds and give you, 
you know, all four zones on your tongue to get, get going on it. Definitely, um, sweet fruit, you know, raisin, molasses. um, molasses. Yep. Not hot again, not hot, but, um, boy, I know this is, uh, one that's going to, you know, kick in with all these others we've been having. Um, boy, such a variety in just the three beers we've shared just between me and JR right here. The great variety, a uh, lot of different things going on in each of these, uh, all good beers in their own rights. I've never seen this before on the shelf. I don't think I've ever heard the name before. So it's kind of fun to kind of go through this and see something new. But the, the carbonation is what's getting me the most on this. It's just a creamy, creamy, um, very, you know, bubbly um, reaction as soon as you take a sip. So this is a real one right from the motherland, right, JR? Yes, sir. It's uh, from Belgian proper. I mean, as compared to the New Glarus or the Avery that we've had, so... Yeah, and uh, I, I agree that the lively carbonation definitely uh, is a factor here. Definitely uh, enhances it, the the taste of this. Um, yeah, definitely. After a couple more sips, I molasses really came out as a flavor. I'm getting maybe a little bit of vanilla, caramel, um, just not as much of of the the juicy fruits as the other ones. But uh, really, a lovely beer, and it's it is really cool to. To see the spectrum of the different, you know, different ones we've had, you know, you can tell that the, the you know, the, the quadruple and the Belgians in particular, you know, you, you, it's not just like one nailed in style. It's like a little pretty broad category on what they can do because you, know, you got the Germans with the Reinheitsgebot, which really uh, restricted the ingredients you can use. And you got the Belgians that said, we don't care about any of that. We'll put whatever we want in. And I think it gives you a lot more freedom to as a brewer to experiment. But this is a, a delight. I find as, it as cool. Beer. Yeah, I find it cool that it was really much darker than the other ones we've had. And the 25th anniversary from New Glarus was pretty dark in its own right, but this one I think outdid that. And uh, the sweetness, it's, a, it's, it's on a sweetness scale, I think, comparable to the other ones we've had. And it's right up there in the same zone. Yeah, I agree. I think it's you know I think the you know the effervescence cuts through some of that sweetness. It's still there, but it just makes it a uh, uh, I don't know a little bit more balanced. But yeah, it's great that we had all three, and all three had a little bit of different characteristics. So yeah, we're really uh, starting to get a little glow here. Eleven <laughs> percent are here. ChristopherMedia.net. ChristopherMedia.net. So I am going to pass the baton on to Dan, I believe, is next. Yes, sir. Hold on one quick second. Sorry. Well, 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 while we're waiting, do we have any hipster tipster news to discuss? I know we're still going through challenges with label approvals, and a lot of breweries are getting real uptight about sitting on beer that they brewed, and now they can't get their label approved to sell it, and... I think one Atlas Brewing today was in the news that they are suing the, I guess the TTB or the government from not being able to, you know, they're losing money because the government shut down and they're not providing services. So perhaps they should just issue a waiver on the labels for now until everybody's back to work because, you know, I guess it's, a, you know, is what it is. It's just part of the repercussion of what's happening in their country, but... Kind of worried about some of these, you know, maybe these smaller ones, smaller craft breweries and smaller startups or ones that have started up and they're trying to expand. And, you know, they're taking, they're taking money and investing for their own future and their own growth and maybe tying it up in additional facilities and additional equipment. And here, if they can't get the paperwork through, you know, they're trying to, you know, tie up their capital, their money. And it's just going to be, you know, unfortunate if some of them have to tank or take a big hit or, you know, take a few steps backwards uh, just because, you know, of the whole the whole scenario. So it's too bad. It's too bad. I hope it I hope it ends soon. We all hope it ends soon. Well, you know, part of you wants to say 
hey, just brew the beer and put it out. And if there's nobody available to approve your label, there's probably nobody available to bust you for, for producing it. But that being said, your livelihood is your liquor license, and you don't want to jeopardize that. So that's probably not the way to go. I do believe that you can still sell uh, beers at your brewery on tap, but you just can't package them. But it's still a huge problem in the industry, and you know, let's all just uh, – cross our fingers that this thing gets resolved soon and you know beer and labels can start flowing again because once everything gets back to normal it's going to be a backlog of these things too so it could be uh several months before the industry is back on its feet again i do have a hipster tipster if, if i could share and i just found that's pretty interesting and maybe this could be a topic for a future episode that we could expound on some more because of the late latest proliferation now of uh well i mean medical marijuana has been going on for a while in many locations many states but now recreational is starting to expand as well but uh, here's a headline that says uh, maryland's flying dog brewery hopes to release a cannabis infused beer called hop chronic thc infused ipa and uh, they're pending approval from the maryland medical cannabis Con commission and, uh, you know, it looks like it's going to be a non-alcoholic beer, actually. But uh, already, you know, here's one of probably more than I can count and don't even know about out there that's heading in this direction. So good times ahead, everybody. Pay attention and be careful because now we're going to be getting into cannabis-infused beers. And what's that going to do, you know, from all sorts of different standpoints from suppliers to ingredients to the strength of this stuff to the laws behind uh you know driving under the influence all this kind of stuff i mean it's just going to be a crazy ride so buckle up and uh let's see where this thing goes yeah and all the big beer companies have already invested in uh you know, piloting brands and uh you know formulas for stuff like this it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So it's it's the wave of the future. It's coming our way. So like I know, you said. I know uh, this past month or this current month of the uh, uh, Michigan Brewers Guild uh, magazine, The Beer Guide, uh, Rex Halfpenny goes into a really nice write-up. If, if you get a chance, for those of you in Michigan that can get a copy of The Beer Guide, uh, read the article. It's a great um, insight, you know, to, to generate some conversation and generate some thinking. And, you know, the, as JR said, you know, the, the wave is upon us and it's coming. So it, it'll be an interesting topic. And I think I'd, I'd love to put a pin in this one so that we can talk about it more in the future. Amen. All right. I think uh, anybody else have anything? But JR, you retweeted something about New Holland uh, within the last few days about um, a new IPA that they're going to be bringing out uh, here in, uh, I believe, February of this year. It was a kombucha IPA, uh, along with uh, their Mexican-style lager that they're going to release in July of this year as well. And then I believe it, it also said something about Dragon's Milk is going to be in cans. You remember that? Yeah, a lot, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of stuff's coming out. You know, people are coming out with new ideas for the new year. You know, again, you know, new dog, old tricks, uh, old dog, new tricks. Uh, yep. Breweries having to constantly innovate. And, you know, what we're seeing here, a perfect example is this big bottle of Avery here. Um, I think this is the last of, of those that merchants had. And the next time they order this, it's going to come in a 12-ounce can. Yeah. You know, uh, the consumer does not want a 22-ounce bottle of an 11-ounce beer or a 10-ounce beer. Or uh, I'm sorry, a, a 22 ounce bottle of a 10 percent beer. Uh, I'll have another drink, please. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. I mean, you got 11 percent beer here. I mean, you know, it's going to be a challenge for Uncle Pete to even finish. Uncle Pete and I to finish this thing. I'll be getting so, home a little later just tonight. Uncle Pete. <laughs> yeah, a 12 ounce a 12 ounce can is much more practical, and a lot of yeah. breweries have not only have they recognized that the smaller sizes are what the consumer wants. Um, they're recognizing that cans are a, vi a much more viable option in many ways. You know, lighter to transport than glass, uh, more, uh, gr you know, more green, more environmentally friendly. It's, uh, you know, so 
you know, I'm looking at a 12 ounce can of resilience that Pete brought me, you know, that's the way, that's where the industry's going, you know, and, uh, I think it's great, but, uh, yeah, I think the bomber will be extinct pretty soon. You're already seeing a lot of companies discontinuing them. Firestone Walker always had their, their big beers like Velvet Merkin and, and Parabola and the bombers. And now they're in, you know, 12 ounce bottles. I so might it's add. Just, that's where we're going. Yeah. I might add as far as cans go, since we're on cans. I mean, as a home brewer, I've already started to see equipment availability out there for home brewers, and you can can your own at home. So, you know, that's kind of cool. I mean, I've been bottling forever, and then more recently in the last five five or ten years, kegging. But uh, if the price can come down on this equipment and the cost of cans, hell, I'll can. Yeah, my local homebrew club, they uh, just got a canner. It's pretty sweet. It's cool. Well, and, uh, you know, crowlers are probably better than growlers and howlers now, you know. Yeah, they last longer. You can, you know, uh, if you if you properly, you know, package them, you know, with no oxygen in the can, they'll last much longer than a growler. So, yeah, lots lots of times are changing. The winds of change are blowing, I guess they would say. By the way, that uh, New Holland Kombucha IPA, uh, it looks like it's a lemon ginger spiced 5% ABV, yeah. which that sounds pretty good to me, as long as it's not overly gingered because, I don't know, maybe some people love ginger, but I, f- I tend to find that most people like the uh, the hints of ginger. And uh, I'm a Marianne guy myself, but if, I, you know, ginger is in the equation, I'm, I'm good with that too. Oh, I'm a ginger guy. All right, Dan, I think, uh, okay. I think that's enough industry news. Let's keep moving <laughs> to Missouri here. Yeah, well, one last little bit. I'm looking forward to uh, Side Projects coming out with a grapefruit beer de pays, which beer de pays is just this beautiful fooder-aged, uh, barrel-aged saison that's really light and complex and has layers and layers of flavor. And uh, every time I drink it, it just seems like I, I, I experience it a little bit different. And that's the normal version of it. Well, they started f- doing different fruited versions of it. And they're going to do a grapefruit one. It's been aged on grapefruits for a year. So I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of that before. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But on to my beer for the next beer for the night. Um, Bourbon Barrel Quad. From Boulevard as well. It is the sixth glass, which I reviewed earlier, and then it is barrel aged, <clears throat> and they um, do something unique with it. Let me pull up the um, description real quick. It says, "Based oh, it's based loosely on the Smokestack series, the sixth glass. This Abbey style quad is separated into a number of oak bourbon barrels." where it ages for varying lengths of time, some for up to three years. Cherries are added to make up for the angel's share of beer lost during barrel aging. Selected barrels are then blended for optimum flavor, resulting the resulting beer retains only very subtle cherry characteristics with toffee, vanilla notes coming to the fore. So let me take a little another sniff here. Definitely get a touch of that sweetness, Cherry. I'm really glad I reviewed the the six glass before because it's not nearly. As, it, it was real dry and not as sweet on the nose, and um, a little fruitiness in there, like um, plums maybe fig, and it's just uh, just a touch of cherries on the front. And then it's like they said, vanilla and toffee. But then it's real. It's real dry. It's got that. I should. I didn't give a proper description. Sorry. It's the same as the other one, pretty much. You know, dark, murky copper, thick head, and um, heavy like like Uncle Pete was talking about. You know, the style is very heavy on the carbonation, so it just tingles across your your tongue, and then it's real dry and it finishes real similar to the other one, leathery, oaky, but it's a little bit sweeter, a little bit more caramel toffee notes, uh, brown sugar. And I, it's funny side by side, the six glass is, it, I mean, you drink it first. The six glass is nice. It's a great quad, uh, speaks probably, you know, really true to the heart of this style. 
um, at least as far as the American version of a Abbey style quad, Belgian style quad, and it's. But man, this bourbon barrel quad is is just it's one of my favorites. I it's one of the first beers that I started aging and doing a vertical of. You know, I've had it back as early as 2010, 2011, um, in my cellar. I think I I just recently finished off that vertical, and uh, I'm gonna have to take another sip here. Hold on. Yeah, touch of cherries, warming. It's just a fantastic beer, and I, I'm glad we're doing this style because I've kind of forgotten about how much I really enjoy this beer because I haven't drank it fresh in a while. I've just been drinking it out of my cellar for so long, and now I remember, oh, yeah, that's why I have so much of it in my cellar because I love this beer. It's fantastic. So, what, What's the vintage on this one? Do you know? This is fresh. I just I bought it. Oh, just, are you, just, are uh, you getting week. much uh, oak wood out of it? Any barrel flavor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a touch of oak. It's not, it's not crazy. It's a little boozy. Um, just, just a little wood, not nothing over, over the top for sure. It's, uh, and this one, they, they put on the label that it's 11.2%, whereas the six glass, they rate at 10.2%. So definitely look it up if you see it in your market. Definitely will. Yes. I know I spent a lot of time, uh, I'd say in the mid two thousands, I probably a year or two years worth of my career down to Kansas city Ford plant. And, uh, was not doing the Beer Nuts podcast at that time, and if I was, I probably would have been hunting this down. Although I did have some Boulevard beers back then, um, but still uh, wasn't aware of this one, so I'll be searching this one out. It sounds great. Yeah, it was mainly uh, Boulevard Pale Ale and Unfiltered Wheat that you could find everywhere back then. On a side note, the first keg ever delivered of Boulevard was their pale ale and uh, hand delivered by John McDonald himself in 1989. So there's your little useless tidbit for the day. <laughs> Good one. Great beer, great review. Thanks, Dan. All right, I think, uh, Greg, I think you got another one to share with us? No, I'm out. Oh, oh come out. on, you lie. <laughs> I, I'm, tell them, I, I'm like All George right. Washington, I tell no lie. Well, oh, speaking of George Washington, I... Sent around, uh, I don't know if I hit both of you guys. Well, Dan, I know you got it. I had a little short video clip of uh, George Washington's beer recipe for a uh, weak beer. Uh, just made with some uh, very little amount of, uh, of grain and uh, hops and molasses. And it was because, I guess, uh, basically to boil everything down, uh, you know, it was better than drinking the water at the time. So... I mean, everybody from kids uh, on up was drinking this uh, weak beer that was prevalent style back in that day because people didn't want to get sick from the water. Hmm. So it it didn't sound bad to me, although the guy in the video made it sound pretty bad, which I thought he was kind of a novice. But nonetheless, I think if we made it today, we could make it taste good. Father of the country, you know, doing beer. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah, definitely it, interesting to, to read, to watch the video. Yeah, like I agree with, with Uncle Pete that it was, the guy made it sound horrible. And I was thinking, wait a second, this is George Washington. He wasn't an idiot. He was smart. He had means. He had access to good ingredients. And, you know, he drank a lot of ale in his day. I'm sure he could figure out how to brew it to be uh, respectably, you know, palatable. Well, they went on to say that it was very low in alcohol, but they also said that everybody drank then because the water they had you know issues with bacteria in the water and even a small amount of alcohol killed that so people of all ages would routinely drink ale then so what a great time to be alive <laughs> Sounds good to me all right well uh this is probably a, a poor choice but uh i've been known to make a poor choice you're on your own now jr i'm not going for I, that you go for it oh uh, you can have just a sip just, just a taster. I don't have any so, room in my glass. We have, we have plenty of beers tonight, but I, I had forgotten actually that I bought a beer for the episode before I went shopping yesterday. So now I have too many, but there's never too many beers, right? So there's I'm gonna never enough. This. So now, uh, since Greg didn't have another one, here's my grand finale. It's a, uh, a beer that those of us from Michigan would be uh, very proud of. It's called Wizard Burial Ground from Brewery Vivan out of Grand Rapids. Yes. It's a bourbon barrel aged quadruple ale. This is the 2018 release, 10% ABV. So, well, I'm waiting for Pete to make some room in his glass just to at least have a thimble full to, to sample with me. I'm going to read the can before I pour it out into my glass, not pour it out. 
It's a uh, brewed once a year. This special quadruple is aged in freshly drained bourbon barrels and disappears into the shadows for a full year of cellaring. This year's brew becomes next year's release. The alcohol content of the quad pulls the bourbon, vanilla, and charred oak character out of the barrel and melds it all together with the caramel richness already present. We've been wood aging beers and experimenting with wild fermentation since we opened in 2010. Join us at our annual Wood Age Beer Festival each autumn to find out more. Suggested pairing, this is a beer to be shared, to truly indulge, enjoy blue cheese, stuffed dates, wrapped in bacon with a balsamic glaze. Well, I don't think we're going to have that available tonight, but let's open the beer and try it out, because this is a treat. You do much better with English than yes. the Belgian and Dutch kind of stuff. <laughs> I got to get to my... Uh, what do they call that uh, thing you get for the car to learn new languages? I got to get the Flemish. The, the blow tube before you drive? What? No, the uh, Rosetta Stone. That's it. Oh. I need the Flemish Rosetta Stone lessons. Belgian for so dummies. I just, but I just poured this into the glass. The first thing I notice is it's really clear. A lot of the ones we had tonight, at least when you first pour them, are, are, are muddy or, or hazy. Um, some of them have settled out, but this one in particular, is, you know, really nice and clear, and it's got a really nice, like, golden to ruby. I guess it's kind of like an orange to ruby red. Uh, nice, nice, clear cop- copper color. It looks just copper. That's perfect descriptor. But, you know, nice, healthy head. It's not going all the way away. A lot of them, most of them, just uh, the head just disappears. This one's uh, lingering longer. And a nice lacing on the glass. I'm smelling a little bit of bourbon, not a lot, but just a little bit on the aroma, and, and more sweetness, sweet malt, maybe a little bit of a raisiny smell. So let's take this in. Wow, is this good? It's fantastic, really, really flavorful. I'm trying to pull it out. Uh, it's a little cleaner, maybe a little lighter mouthfeel than the other ones we've had. It's not quite as is thick and, and sweet and syrupy like some of the others. That's not a bad thing. Still got sweetness, and it's got uh, more of a caramel toffee vanilla. Definitely vanilla. I'm getting a lot of a lot of the features of the oak barrel in it. You know, not the bourbon barrel, the oak barrel. You know, the vanilla, the, the, the charred oak. Um, gosh, it's really, really much different than the ones we've had. Less sweet and more oak barrel-y. Um, the bourbon's there, and it's nice. But it's not overpowering. I'm uh, kind of challenged for some of the descriptors here, but I, again, I I favor the, uh, more of the you know vanilla, oaky, charred barrel, and a little bit of bourbon in this. It's it's really really good. Uh, I remember having this before and not being this impressed. This year's version is outstanding. What do you think, Pete? I know uh, I had to like uh, crowbar uh, his mouth open to to take another sip. He didn't well, really want to have another beer, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm cheating a little bit. I don't have, I've only got two glasses here and they both have the previous beers in them and I don't want to chug them. So I uh, did a sniff out of the can and a taste out of the can. So really the aroma, the first thing that hit me was, uh, you know, oak wood. And then, uh, you know, it didn't have any of the aromas really similar to the other beers we've already had. Didn't get a sweetness aroma. Just got more of a woody, oaky aroma. And then on the flavor, honest, honestly, it's it's interesting. I get the vanilla. It's very creamy on the mouthfeel. A very sweet, sugary. Um, to me, it, I, I'm thinking milk chocolate for some reason. I don't know why, but I mean, it's just got this. Um, interesting sweetness it's hard to describe i don't know jr i'm i'm at a loss here i mean i don't get it's not like tobacco or leather or spice but there's a an interesting component and for some reason milk chocolate comes to mind well i'm not getting any of that and i'm not really a chocolate fan. have another sip but um are we drinking out of the same can yep <laughs> mine's in a, a proper glass though and I don't get chocolate in any way, uh, but I definitely get oak, a lot of vanilla, a lot of oak, a little bit of charred oak, um, and yeah. But the the mouth feels really nice. It's 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 not as thick as 
and full bodied as the other ones, but it, that's not a bad thing at all. It's I'm really enjoying this. And, uh, I am getting a little bit of a uh, maybe a little touch of uh, like raisin cherry, a little bit of dark fruit. Yeah, I'm that, that now as to. well. That that you mention it. That's kind of though. emerged later. Much different. Much yeah, different. More subtle, but I think. Most of the flavor of this is coming from the oak barrel. That's what I'm getting out of this compared to you know the, the rest of them were, or from the malt and the ingredients. Um, I'm not getting too much Belgian. I'm surprised because uh, Vivant is known for their Belgian style beers. I expected there to be a big Belgian yeast influence, but I think this the barrel really has has taken center stage, and that's not a bad thing at all. But I'm glad I uh, I'm glad I purchased this. Uh, this beer is six ninety nine for a single uh, sixteen ounce can, and they get a four packs around like twenty eight bucks. Um, so it's not cheap, um, but well worth the price. Uh, you get what you pay for, and uh, you know this rests in oak barrels for a full year, and it's certainly worth uh, every penny. Highly recommended if you can get this. Greg, have you ever had this? Yes, sir. Well, you guys. Uh Got me thirsty, uh, wanting a can of my own right now. So, I'll definitely be looking out for that again. And one of my favorites from uh, from the, from themselves. So, great job reviewing it. Well, and I, I know that we've had Doug speak highly of of the brewery on several occasions on the show. So I won't go too deep into that. Just to say that anybody that goes to Grand Rapids, Michigan, you would be doing yourself a disservice not to make sure you go to Brewery Vivant. Yeah. <laughs> the old it's an old funeral home right <laughs> um yep. looks kind of like a chapel um you know stained glass windows and the whole thing but uh unbelievable uh food there their food offerings are tremendous and uh beer and, and, and their beers are fantastic so when in gr seek these guys out you're well, I've got, usa i i've definitely got uh, as pete would say a glow on now um yeah. Fortunately, uh, I'm home, so I don't have to go anywhere. Yeah, really, not fair. <laughs> so uh, maybe one of these weeks I'll have to go to to Rockwood and go to Pete's to, for payback. Um, but uh, certainly uh, been uh, a, a wide variety of quads. You know, we've had some traditional ones, and you know the Strafa Hendrick we had that was a real dark and almost like a porter, um, all the way to the Reverend, which was a uh, probably the sweetest of all of them. Um, they all had their own uniqueness to them. Um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, it's been a nice ri- uh, nice visit to the quad sector um, and uh, enjoying the uh, different varieties of quads that we've had tonight. You know, they were all unique in their own way, and that's, that's what's cool about it. And you know what? One thing I would recommend to our, our listeners is, Next time you're in the beer store, don't ignore the Belgian section. You know, go see what's there from Belgium. They're imports. They're not going to be cheap. You know, anything you could get from uh, um, St. Bernardus is one of my favorite Belgian breweries. Anything that you could get from them. Um, they did have a quad, but it was a gigantic bottle. But I didn't think that, uh, you know, if it was a smaller, again, you know, from the bomber thing, you know, if it was a smaller serving, I would have bought that one. But, um, I, you know, let's not forget our uh, traditional you know, Belgian beers, you know, there's... Uh, Chimay, Roquefort, West Lateran, Orval, you know, all kinds of them out there. I agree with you, Jer. There's a, there's a whole section in most of your local beer stores, not not 7-Eleven necessarily, but, you know, a, a, a beer and wine store, liquor store. You'll find a lot of great Belgian beers. Uh, experiment a little. Reach out and try a little bit. Hopefully what we've gone and reviewed tonight uh, will give you a little bit of uh, inspiration, and uh, we hope you have a great experience with it. Amen. So, uh, closing comments, anyone? Anybody had a favorite? Well, I guess it's hard to say. <laughs> we all had, had our favorite. favorites. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it's certainly a style that you don't see a lot of these days. I mean, there, there's a, there's obviously the, the ones that produce it, you know, quite a bit, but it'd be nice to see, you know, more breweries getting into this and maybe trying a few different things to go along with it. So maybe it's a, a trend that's waiting to pop like everything else that's uh, happening these days. Well, it's certainly a perfect uh, style for this kind of year with the cold weather hitting us here in Michigan. 
it'll warm your innards. So we're, we're expecting some snow this weekend. Uh, you know, it'd be a great, great style to go pick up a few bottles and, you know, curl up by the fire, maybe watch some football this weekend. Um, so, well, I found out in pure Dutch, the most common way of saying cheers is Proust. Ooh, it's very similar Proust. to the German uh, Prost that Proust. we usually share, but uh, Proust is the word from the Dutch. So Proust, may it be good for you. Proust. <laughs> Proust. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. You can catch us on Twitter at Beer Nuts Podcast. I think we have a, a, a Beer Nuts Podcast Facebook page. Um, you know, we're really kind of not in our right place without Chris here. So, Christopher, we appreciate all you do for us. If you were here, you would be able to Twitter this, Instagram that. But you can find us on all those platforms. We're not hard to find. But please, we always uh, would love feedback. Uh, give us ideas for future episodes. Tell us what you're drinking. Send us some Instagram pictures of the beers you drink. And then, uh, without you, it wouldn't be all worth it. So thanks for listening. And I think it's time to head to good old Mexico City. So as they say in old Mexico City, A-M-F. ChristopherMedia.net. ChristopherMedia.net. If you like this show, please tell a friend. Please make sure to rate and comment on all your favorite Christopher Media shows. Please follow us on Twitter and like and share us on Facebook. You can subscribe to all ChristopherMedia.net shows for free on ChristopherMedia.net. Thank you for listening, and thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net.